Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. So, we all know that a big part of getting your MBA is getting outside your comfort zone. Going to an elite program, being with all different types of people, you know, burying your head in new subjects, new industries, and new ways of being. But what about getting your MBA in a foreign country where you don't even speak the local language and building a five-year career after that MBA in that locality, even starting your own business and now working for a pretty big company in your industry. Well, that's what this week's guest has done. Tony De Gennaro is an American who had lived in New Jersey, had studied in New Jersey, but on a whim went to China to teach English, ended up in Hong Kong, and then ended up applying to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is one of Asia's top universities and MBA programs. So in this conversation, Tony talks about why he feels like he benefited from enrolling in this program. Tony is a really colorful character. I enjoyed having this conversation with him and I just really appreciated his openness and frankness, answering all my questions about what he did and didn't get out of his MBA experience. Some of the questions I asked him were, can entrepreneurship be taught? What is it like as a foreigner to try to find a marketing job in a country where you don't even speak the native language? You know, what did he most get out of business school? Yeah, for those of you who really want to push your comfort zone and really want to go on a life adventure the way Tony has, I think you'll really enjoy this conversation and realize that while there are many challenges of studying in a foreign country, it can also be a very fruitful life experience and you can even stand out in that market. And um, although Tony never talks about this explicitly, I think you'll understand how to do it through his story. Remember that if you need help figuring out which MBA program fits you best, we offer free school selection help at touchmba.com. Please, if you enjoy this podcast, rate the show, give us an honest review on Apple Podcasts. I haven't made that request for, what, maybe 20 episodes. So if you guys could help us out there, that would be fantastic. And yeah, if you have any feedback on the content of the show, many of you have gotten signed up for free school selection help. So you know my email. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. I'd love to hear back from you. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Tony DeGennaro. Tony, thank you so much for your time and welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. All right, thanks for having me. <laughs> so Tony, if you can just, let's just start with the good stuff. Take me back to the mid 2010s. You know, you had worked for a couple years. You had graduated from, from Rutgers, I believe, right? Yeah, Rutgers in New Jersey. Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, I saw you studied, you know, political science, German studies and philosophy. That's, that's a lot. Did you major in all three of those? Um, I double majored in um, political science and philosophy and had a minor in German. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Not much time to uh, have fun during university, yeah. huh? Yeah, I had fun and like, hey, I still had fun. Come on, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's super impressive. So after, you know, maybe you can just, yeah, take us back to when you started thinking about your MBA. What were you doing then? And then kind of, yeah, walk me through why you wanted to get an MBA and then why you were thinking of Hong Kong as a destination. Well, I mean, realistically, I like kind of was all over the place when I first graduated after my undergraduate. Um, I, yeah, political science and philosophy is not a great degree if you want a job. <laughs> so um, basically, I 
was struggling to find a job. I was doing sales at the time, and I like did not love it. Right, I was selling criminal background checks. So like, <laughs> so like, imagine like Walmart does a pre-employment screening on an employee. It was my company that was doing the screening. Um, so I was selling wholesale background checks, like thousands at a time and stuff like that. Uh, like three dollars a pop or something like that. It was ridiculous, and like um, so, yeah, it was really boring. Um, and I was looking to move on. I actually originally wanted to be a lawyer, so I felt like kind of in the same vein. So I was kind of happy at first. I thought that was a good experience, but yeah, I kind of figured law school was still at least a few years away for me anyway. Um, so in the meantime, I was like, hey, why not go to China? Like, uh, actually, I wanted to go to Germany in line with my minor, but I actually tore my ACL that year so I missed the hiring season and I had gotten a like a teaching English certificate right to teach English in another country and so my plan was to Germany and get like super fluent in German um, so I had an opportunity so I had a friend who was going to China and they were like hey why don't you come with me and I was just like yeah, okay <laughs> like and so I ended up in Beijing um, I remember just getting off the plane and being in clouds of smog uh, in 20 like 13 yeah it was pretty rough back then. I think it's changed quite a lot uh, but uh, yeah so I taught English there for like a year and a half I came back to the US for a little bit after that and then um, I just uh, actually I was dating a girl at the time in China and she wanted to move to Hong Kong so I ended up moving over here um, so I I was actually still doing English teaching when I came here, but then I realized, like, I hate this. I was like, yeah, I gotta literally, like, feel like I don't use my brain. <laughs> like, I'm just, like, doing the ABCs with kids. It's not really, like, it's great to travel around and, like, as an example, but, like, you don't feel like you're living up to your potential, I guess. Um, that's why I really, like, I remember I was like, all right, I'm gonna do business school. Like, I, like, now... Oh, like we looked at law school. I was like, that's three and a half years. No way. I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, so a business degree is a little more manageable. And I still think it gives me that leg up to like get into a different career. Um, Cause like a lot of people, when they look for MBAs, like they look for it for career advancement. I was more on the career shift. Mm, one. Yes. Like I really wanted to get out of English teaching. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, so I knew nothing about business going in. I always say like I got the most value out of my MBA because I knew, went in knowing nothing. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't have the formal business education, right? And <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, so anyway, I was teaching English. I remember I was studying for my GMAT on every lunch break. Um, I had the big, thick Princeton review book that I was through the whole time. Um, and luckily I did pretty well on the GMAT and it got me into CUHK. Um, that was actually like probably the first choice I had in Hong Kong because of like it was between that and UST, of course, you know, the two yes. big ones. HKUST, yeah. yes. Yeah, and I actually missed the cutoff to UST. <laughs> so I was like, see which K it is. <laughs> yeah, and I got in and I was, that's how it happened. <laughs> wow. So you, so I mean, first of all, I just love your story how you're just kind of falling into these things. Uh, I think that's my whole life is just kind of falling into stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I, I actually appreciate you mentioning that because, I mean, I think that's certainly the case for me in many ways as well for my career. But, you know, of course, in the business world, it's always nice to have a narrative and, you know, to present this well-planned journey from A to B to C to D, which was H U C U H K, right? And then to, to E and F. But... Yeah, that's not clearly not always the case for a lot of business school applicants. Um, my first plan when I went to China, I remember after leaving America, my plan was to come back a Mandarin speaking DJ lawyer. Right. <laughs> like I wanted right. to learn how to DJ, to like study for the LSAT and uh, yeah. learn. So I did one of three. I learned Mandarin. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. So so hey, that, yeah, that is a uh, that is a very a very small niche. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's looking for those kind of people. <laughs> right, right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay, so you applied to CUHK, uh, you're a little bit late with HKUST, you got into CUHK. What were your goals at the time? I mean, right, clearly you wanted to study business, but, and you had the sales ex uh, work experience as well as teaching English. Did you have very clear goals at the time? Honestly, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to get into marketing, right? Because of like, 
when I think about it, right, I'm always good at English at writing, and that's always been kind of my strong suit, right? So I always looked at marketing as like the the career path for those not as mathematically inclined, you know, <laughs> like yeah. So like I mean, because for example, like on the GMAT, I got 99th percentile on English, and I got like 60th percentile on math, <laughs> but I got score because the English was so high, right? And that's always been like. I've always done good on English stuff and writing and like um, that kind of stuff and formulating essays and stuff. But when it comes to math, I am not great. <laughs> Did you have any marketing experience before? Um, luckily, actually, in my sales role, my first one that I did, actually, I learned like SEO, actually, when I was okay. first doing it. Exactly. So I have some experience, not right. a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had a, like a dabbling in it. You had a dabbling. Well, and, and that's really interesting because I think a lot of times, especially for international students, they're often advised not to pursue marketing in a country that is not in their foreign, uh, their their native tongue language, right? So someone from Vietnam, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I agree with them. It's actually quite hard. Um, like, uh, yeah, it's like, I mean, in Hong Kong, it's not easy. Right. Like, so, I mean, finding jobs that they only want English is tough. Like um, people will expect you to be fluent in both. Um, and you're not you won't un really know what's going on with the general population if you don't speak Cantonese. Right. It's just not realistic. So, I mean, there are companies out here that are international, though. Like there is opportunities. I'm not saying there's not. But you are definitely drawing from a smaller pool than you would be if you spoke both. Mm. But did your Mandarin help you? I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this in full detail, you know, when we talk about your post MBA journey, but was, let me just ask right now, was your Mandarin, did that kind of factor it, in? It, it helps. It doesn't like, the thing is, cause like I can speak well, I can't read. <laughs> like, that's the problem. So like writing, like, I mean, that's like a whole other animal, right? Like, I mean, I remember I was like, probably knew at least like 1500 characters at one point probably down to like 200 now that I recognize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think all, all, all students of Chinese will understand exactly what you mean by, you know, number of characters, you know, and, and those fade very quickly if you don't keep reading. Uh, I was in your same boat as well. So I, I understand that, you know, you know, our audience, is there anything else from that application, you know, part one of your journey that, you know, you would like to share or anything to keep in mind? Oh, actually, I almost forgot about this. Like, actually, I did have a bit more of a structured plan than I thought. I remember, actually, now, sorry if, if I want to re-answer this. Um, so, actually, at the time, my uncle was a, he still is, he's um, a coffee futures trader, right? So, like, I actually wanted to get into commodities and coffee, and that's what I said in my interview, <laughs> which I definitely did not even come close to doing. So, um but yeah, that was my initial intention was thinking to do uh, coffee trading as a commodity trader. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't that, know. Yeah. Well, just an idea from my uncle. I thought it was cool. <laughs> I mean, did you present, was that like, oh, this is my goal or did you present a few options? I mean, I think in the back of my head, I knew that wasn't real. Um, and I just used it as like a front you know, when I was going in. Um, right myself seem more serious like my uncle's a coffee trader i'm gonna be a coffee trader <laughs> <laughs> right it seems somehow more relevant yeah i mean just <laughs> better than being just some english teacher guy who wants to learn marketing <laughs> well let's okay let's dive into that let's dive into your mba experience because you know that there is that sense of kind of imposter syndrome right like you don't have the business background you had a little bit of marketing that's what you wanted to do you're in business school you're with presumably a lot of more experienced business people in traditional like finance, consulting industries and so forth. What was the biggest challenge for you? Well, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I really was quite inexperienced. So like, honestly, going into like corporate financial reporting and learning accounting was like a nightmare for me. Like I was literally studying so hard and I still did bad on the test. <laughs> like, I mean, there was a lot of things that just I think a lot of people already had experience with that I was experiencing encountering for the first time. So it did put me at a bit of a disadvantage, I think. Um, luckily, I can kind of rely on charisma for some things. But um, when it comes to like the hard skills with like uh, finance and things like that, I remember learning like CapEx and stuff. I had never even heard of this stuff before. Like, so, yeah, it was pretty daunting initially. Um, I mean, even 
just even dress code, right? My first day, I remember everyone in my batch will give me crap still to this day. Um, because on the first day, I didn't see that it was formal attire. <laughs> and I came in wearing shorts and a t-shirt with like a floral Hawaiian shirt oh, and no. with a bright orange backpack. And I, yeah, I got a lot of crap for that the whole year. <laughs> Well, you probably also got a lot of attention, and yeah. and and right. I mean, there you go. You're unforgettable yeah. now. <laughs> How many people were in your class that year? I think there was about eighty. About eighty. Yeah. 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 It wasn't too big, but it was like eh, good size. Mm. And and what was that experience? Not only learning, say, you know, difficult sort of quant subjects and finance subjects that you were unfamiliar with, but doing it with an international, a more international class? Or what was your class comprised of? Yeah, I would say it was like a good portion. We had a lot of Indian classmates, a lot of mainland Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese, and then uh, we had like some Germans, some Taiwanese, a uh, pretty good mix, honestly. Um, Koreans, a lot of Korean guys, um, anybody else, Japanese. So like, yeah, I got a lot of exposure to people, like cultures I had never gotten before, which was pretty, re actually really cool. Um, and I think because it was so diverse that everyone was a lot more forgiving, um, especially with like language barriers and stuff. Everybody was pretty helpful, actually, which was really nice and pretty refreshing, I would say. And how else did you overcome, you know, those those quant challenges or, or... help? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I like I had like, for example, it was like it, we actually got separated into like um, distinct groups for the whole program. And so they actually designed it that way so that, like, even if you got people you didn't get along with, you had to figure it out and do it anyway, right? Like, so, I mean, like, and, but I did have, like, two or three core guys in my group that, like, were there with me helping me with finance. <laughs> Doing the same for them. I was, like, proofreading all their essays. And, like, right. Know? Yeah. So, I mean, it was actually really collaborative and helpful. I liked it. Yeah. I got it. I got it. So yeah. So what did you, you know, you studied at CRHK for a year, right? Yeah. For one year, a one year program. And what did you really get from the experience? I mean, I actually still to this day, I think I learned like so much, I don't know, just lingo, I would say is the biggest thing I would mm. listen. Interesting. Like, I feel like I can carry my way through a business conversation at like any level now. Like, I mean, I'm like talking to stock traders, I could be talking to like hedge funds, I can be talking to like, an, I don't know, the marketing department of an MNC, and I have no problem with any of them. Right? Like, and it's just understanding business models, I would say, mm. is the, like, because of like, now I can look at a business, I'm like, that's how they make money. Like, how does this business make money? Like, I feel like half the time people look at something like, I don't know, BuzzFeed, and they have no idea how they make money. Right? Like, it's just... A better understanding of how every kind of business works is really valuable on its own, I think. Wow, that's that's really cool. I mean, in terms of, I want to break both of those down. In terms of the lingo, when do you think it clicked for you? I mean, yeah. Oh, so we had this one class. I still say my favorite professor was mm. uh, this guy Tom Bain. Um, he, I remember he was like a, a bond, a fixed income trader for uh, J.P. Morgan, I think, or Morgan Stanley. I forget which one. But he was such an amazing teacher, right? Like, I love that he did this. He did, I, I, people, some people probably hated this, but I loved it. He did a vocabulary quiz at the start of every class. So he would have, like make you learn like 30 terms and he would test you on like 15 of them. Like he would randomly select 15 at the start of every class. Right. And it was a five to 10 minute thing at the start of every class. And it really drilled it into me. Like I, I really learned from that. Like, and it was just like generic anything kind of finance terms. Like, I mean, I know still know what the what the Black Scholes model is just because of that. <laughs> or like how to price a derivative or something. It is I forget. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, but a lot of lingo, right, is not just knowing the terms, but like using them with confidence. Yeah, it's true. No, I mean, so uh, I mean, yeah, I don't really know when it clicked. I mean, it's. <laughs> seems to have at some point i don't know but uh i guess yeah i mean i mean i think probably because of that gate that class alone gave me the confidence to go into more finance classes i was taking finance classes that i didn't have to mm. even in my term just because of i was actually interested by this point hmm interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that was very new to me <laughs> being interested in anything quant related wow 
And and what about the business models? Like, kind of what classes helped you there, or what part of the curriculum helped you, you know, cut to the core of of business models? For that stuff, it was entrepreneurship related classes because they were more teaching you like how to build a business and things like that. Um, those ones were like I don't know, just kind of explaining all these like revenue models and things like that for different kinds of businesses. Like, and we were doing tons of case studies on like things that like Starbucks and stuff, how they make money off licensing fees and franchising and stuff like that. It was really interesting. <laughs> and were those case studies like really centered around businesses in Asia or globally? Um, I would say there was a good amount that were in Asia, but still some global ones, of course. Like I remember, like for example, like Maersk was one of them, the, the Danish shipping company. Hmm. Uh, but we did like, for example, uh, you're from Hong Kong, right? Giordano. Oh man, <laughs> I have a long history with Giordano. <laughs> My yeah. my parents were buying me Giordano sweatpants, like since <laughs> I was a, a little kid. Yeah, and that was a case study, like right. And I was, like I didn't even know this was like a little <laughs> company. I was like, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but it was uh yeah no I think so definitely entrepreneurship definitely helped with the business model stuff. Right now, you know, your your current roles or your past roles have been mostly marketing and business development related. Yeah. Right. Which is, I would say, very closely related to sort of at least early stage entrepreneurial sort of skills. And I'm one and I'm wondering if you think that entre, you know, can entrepreneurship be really taught in, in school? Because I know COHK really uh, like promotes itself as, you know, being a, kind of on the vanguard of teaching entrepreneurship, specifically in Asia, of course. But um, yeah, I'm just wondering, yeah, w w what are your thoughts there? Okay, so I mean, I would say there's definitely some parts of entrepreneurship that we can be taught, but there's definitely some parts that can't. Like, I mean, there's nobody telling you, like, I don't know, how to reduce your tax liabilities on your small business, like, and things like that in your classes. I mean, I don't know if you, like, so, like, I was running my own company for, like, three years after. Well, talk, can you talk about that? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, like, it was rough. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't prepare for how rough it is. <laughs> the amount of stress that there is in running your own business, like, it was pretty bad. Like, um, but I would say, in terms of teaching it, yeah, I think... Until you're in the thick of it, you're, you don't really, and you don't realize how much you're learning as you're doing it. That's the thing. Like, I, I, I would never, like, so my business is no longer existent. I sold, I mean, it exists, but I sold it off just like my shares, right? So it's actually being run by another guy now. Um, but, like, I still would, like, and I feel like theoretically you could say it was, like, kind of a waste of time. I didn't make it and become, like, a millionaire or anything. Mm. But, like, I learned so much in that time period. Right. Like, so I think just the educational value of entrepreneurship is incredible. Right. Like, yeah. What was the business? What was the business that you started? So it was actually, I didn't start it. It's a funny story. So um, I actually was interning <laughs> at this business, right? So it was during, actually- a, During your MBA? Yep. Okay. So it, it was actually a previous alumni um, named uh, Jerry. Um, yeah. So he was actually uh, from the year before me. And he actually was starting two companies at the same time, like a madman. Um, and he basically brought me on to help with one of them while he was kind of more focused on the other one, right? So I actually was basically starting this from like basically nothing. We just had a website, right? Like a very basic website. And so I was like writing all the marketing material, building out all the pitch decks. And it was meant to be, we were gonna try and do a subscription as a service for WeChat advertising and WeChat marketing mm. in Maine. So we were gonna try and have like, I don't know, foreign companies just pay like 500 bucks a month and we'll open you a WeChat account and maintain it for you in China, right? Like, yeah. That was the concept. Um, little did we know that WeChat marketing is ridiculously complicated and there's no way 500 bucks is gonna cover what you need to do on there, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so um, basically we gave up on that pretty fast and um, we kind of just became a small China marketing agency. Hmm. So. We were basically helping foreign businesses entering mainland China. And um, that's and that's where I really got to learn SEO because I got like amazing at SEO while I was doing <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think I still, my articles like still rank number one for like anything Chinese social media related. Um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, 
But so anyway, the guy actually um, gave up on that business and let me buy into it, and I ended up taking it over um, because of, he was more focused on his other business, which was more techy and uh, had, could get a higher valuation. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, than an agency. Agencies are not worth much. <laughs> They're tough, tough businesses. But so, how many years did you did you run that agency? Three, so that you said, like, right? Three years, yeah. So um, I mean, made it past the first year. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, like, basically, the first year was like I was making like I don't know a thousand USD a month. <laughs> like it was terrible. Right. Uh, like so, because I like, got everything we made. I was reinvesting in the business, right? Yes. And so, like, um, but eventually, like, it did. We did get our first couple of big clients, and that let us hire people. And then we just kept growing from there. And um, at one point, we got to like almost twenty-five employees. So we did get pretty big. That's <laughs> amazing! Oh my gosh! Had to downsize after, but we got right, pretty big. right, right. Yeah! Wow. <laughs> See, this is again coming back to that like falling into things, <laughs> like kind of fell into that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, what happened since we're here? What happened? You know, after you closed up that business, or w what happened since? It was like I, it was pretty stagnant, right? I just like, I mean, we had three partners that we were all paying like each other ourselves decent salaries, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's just like we our overhead was too high. I felt like we had too many partners. Like mm -hmm. I just felt like at this point I had built them a pretty good web presence, and I felt kind of unnecessary at that point, right? Because mm -hmm. of like. So the execution work and things like that, like the actual work we're doing for clients was not done by me. It mm. was done by like Chinese partners mm. who could actually re do Chinese, right? Like, so I kind of felt like I was wasted again, <laughs> kind of like, mm. so it felt like it was better off to just kind of like, and I didn't see it like skyrocketing to the moon anytime soon. Right. So I was eh, okay, you guys can take this over. You're doing well. You don't need me anymore, <laughs> right? So, and then I, they gave me a, like a nice, chunk of change for my shares and then sent me on my way <laughs> nice and then what, what did you do after that so um honestly i was planning on taking a break um and just hanging out because it was quite stressful for like three years of running my own business um sorry like, yeah, were you making... were you based in mainland china while you're running oh, no. this agent? you're based in hong kong yeah okay so yeah so moving co-working space to co-working space <laughs> gotcha gotcha yep yep so um, I actually did have a, a small team in Shenzhen, though, um, and we would go back and forth. So because of we need basically our customers were on Western platforms, right? So I had to bring in customers through Google, and Facebook, and all these kind of things. Yes. And I couldn't really do that sitting in Shenzhen without a VPN, <laughs> which right. I didn't want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's why we kind of kept a team. We actually kept our sales team over here, and then we kept the execution team in Shenzhen. Yeah, and you were planning to take a break, but then... I forgot what I was going. <laughs> so I was planning on taking a break. Uh, but like I went home to the US and I was like, yeah, let me shoot out some job applications. And just first page responded so quickly. I was just like, yeah, why not? I'll go in for an interview when I came back. And they literally gave me an offer the same day I went into the interview. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and yeah. And that's how it's been. I've been there since. <laughs> so explain, yeah, what first page digital does. So first page is actually like a multidisciplinary agency. So we do like everything, like Facebook, Google, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, uh, programmatic advertising, Amazon advertising, all things that I wanted to learn. So uh, that's kind of like why I decided to go into this because I had like experience with Google advertising, for yeah. example, like Facebook and SEO, of course. But um, there was a whole ton of other channels that I had no experience with. And I've kind of decided, like, my, like, because realistically, my goal, I mean, my role at Dragon Social, my company, was to be, like, a, I was, like, a marketing manager, right? Like, the head of marketing. And I realized I like that. <laughs> I kind of, like, want to be a head of marketing. Wow. So I kind of wanted to get more of an exposure to all these other channels that would make me more of an all-rounded marketer. Yes. And, and so who are you guys, like, uh, who hires you guys? Chinese firms or, or Western firms? Anyone? Everybody. 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 <laughs> like, I have like I have clients in America. I have clients in China. I have clients in the Philippines. I have clients everywhere. Got know? it. Because we're actually regional, so like we have offices kind of all across Southeast Asia. So the headquarters is in Australia, and then we got like Hong Kong office, Singapore, and Thailand that are all like sixty plus people each. Wow. Okay. So yeah. it's a pretty yeah, it's a decent sized company. Yeah. Definitely a like. Say like above a boutique agency, but right. not fully 
uh, WPP levels or anything. <laughs> right, right. Wow. What a, what a journey, yeah. huh? Slowly making my way up there, you know? <laughs> Where do you see, like, kind of the future of of this industry? That's a tough one. Like digital marketing in general? <laughs> Is that the question? Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes coming up over the next couple of years. I mean, so we got like, first of all, TikTok has become a force to be reckoned with. Like it is unbelievable what you can do with that thing now. Like, and I feel so old for the first time in my life that this is the first social media platform. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, it's like, I mean, I loved Vine back in the day, but like, I don't know. Like, it's also because Hong Kong, we actually don't have TikTok, right? Like, so they pulled out of this market, so I don't uh, even get it. Yeah, yeah. And so then there's also like, um, so that's one thing. Um, third party tracking for ads is going to be gone probably pretty soon. Google's talked about it for years and they put it off another year. It was actually supposed to happen this year. Um, and that's going to change how things work like drastically. Um, there's even little things like, like iPhones changing their privacy policies have like changed how I work. Like, you know, so it's really, you've got to be on top of news here in this industry because of like little changes on like, cause most of the time you're playing in other people's platforms. If they change the rules on those platforms, you have no control over it and you need to adjust. So that's the main thing. So there will always be changes in digital marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, which part of it are you most excited about? I mean, so I personally love content. Like I love creating content. Like, so an SEO, when you do SEO with it, right? Like I love getting a, like a blog or something to rank for a keyword that like, yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's so satisfying. <laughs> I don't know. Like when I go like, Hey, I know my article ranks. If I type this in, I type it in. It's like the number one result. I'm like, yes, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I mean that stuff. And when an ad campaign goes well, that's actually another thing. When you like prove an ROI, like, Hey, you spend $3 here. I know you spend $1 here. I can get you $3 back. Like, and you could set up like a machine that literally you just put money into it. And it spits out more on the other side. <laughs> yes. So uh, that is very satisfying as well, I would say. Yeah. And like, it sounds like a lot of that knowledge was gotten on the job. Or did you did you study this at COHK? So COHK, I think like for digital, they were more on like the like overarching theories. I know they've actually changed this. Okay. Since yeah. Uh, but like back when I was there and we had this, like, so we had this like Thai professor. I loved him. He was like, like, so me, I actually needed those core concepts. Like, I didn't have them, right? Like, you know, like the four Ps and stuff like that, that old school stuff. Like, I never knew that. So, like, I guess, like, some people may have found it redundant, but it was still helpful for me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So, I mean, actually, I do remember I gave, I actually went back to CHK like, once or twice and for the marketing club and gave some talks on digital marketing. And they did say, like, that they've started introducing this stuff in more now. Like, I, I thought it was funny. I gave them a, an acronym quiz, like, uh, like what's PPC, CPC, uh, like all these kind of like CPL, all this stuff. And they had no idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was fun. So I think uh, I might do a few more of those in the coming years. <laughs> I can see you're emulating your favorite professor. You've, you've taken that part of his class and that will forever be a part of your, your presentation. I, I think vocabulary quizzes are amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you know one more question on this sort of uh, career marketing careers in hong kong specifically uh you've touched on how it's difficult if you don't speak cantonese you have to really seek out certain paths um but then you're also coming in with an mba uh you have kind of higher perhaps salary expectations or or responsibility expectations so kind of what what can you tell our audience, you know, about that, like um, what to expect and what challenges to deal with there? I will say um, Hong Kong does tend to underpay for anything below manager roles in marketing. OK, so that's just something to be expected. So if you don't have the experience to go straight to manager, you probably will get underpaid slightly. Hmm. Uh, I, it's just the reality. Like Hong Kong is a market that for some reason does not place a huge value on marketing. Um, it's just the way it is. I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> like, mm. um, so, I mean, it, it is, um, but I would say like, once you do get to manager roles, you do make good money, <laughs> like in Hong Kong. 
Um, I would say mostly to look at international companies. Um, yeah. Like you're not going to get a job at like 68 or something if you don't speak English. What, I mean, six, speak 68? Explain. English, a local lingerie company like that caters specifically to Hong Kongers and like Asian body types. Right. <laughs> That's not going to work if you only speak English, right? Like so or – like even Giordano, right? Like that's advertising yep. almost exclusively at the Hong Kong population, mm -hmm. like not even. And also one thing to consider even in with Hong Kong, like there's like there are a lot of foreigners here, but we do make up a pretty small part of the population still. Like I think it's actually only 400,000 and that includes like domestic helpers and things like that. Wow. So, I mean, it's not big. Like, I mean, so people aren't going to waste money marketing to us, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm a very minority. So um, you will be looking at companies that are like based in Hong Kong and looking to go international. Mm. So the kind of companies that you would have more success with. So like fintech companies, they are not just looking at Hong Kong, for example. Um, you look at trading companies that are doing like e-commerce and stuff like that. They are international. They don't care about just Hong Kong. right? And in those kind of roles, you will have more success finding a job. Mm. That's great advice. And how would you, a follow-up would be, how would you recommend say someone starting at cohk this year to kind of get their foot in the door to meet these companies or to yeah to well, get in front of them i will say one thing that's great about hong kong it's a very small place so you go to like events and meetups and stuff like that it's usually like 15 20 minutes away from your house so i honestly feel like they are a great way to meet people I know tons of people who get jobs here just by meeting someone and getting just recommended to the right person uh, like hong mm. kong is a small so that kind of stuff does travel around. So I honestly feel like, and don't be pushy about it. That's also one thing I hate. Like, I'm sorry with MBA students. Sometimes they come up to you like, I need a job. <laughs> I don't know. Like, okay, cool, cool down. Like we just met. <laughs> so, right. Um, so I would say like, it is good to go to events, but don't be pushy about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I feel like if you don't go to events and you can't find a job, then I actually feel like you're kind of being lazy. Just go. Mm. <laughs> So a lot of a lot of boots on the ground, sort of just getting out there. I mean, I know you were the what you were the president of the marketing marketing club, right? At CUHK. Yeah, that helped. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about that. The role of student clubs did that help a little bit, or? Yeah, it definitely did. So I got actually. I remember like. Um, so my dream always. I'm a huge video gamer, right? So I was like, uh, I want to get into like a marketing department for a video game company, right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I remember uh, Riot Games was based in Hong Kong, like so for League of Legends, and I actually through the marketing department I asked them to come and do a speech, right? And then um, they actually were like, "Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do it." And then like last second, like their headquarters like shut the office down, mm -hmm. so like, they actually became like a creative only office here. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically, though, like I ended up meeting like tons of people through that guy who I was talking to at Riot, and I'm still like building my network in that industry i'll get there eventually <laughs> yeah it is it's a really exciting space i mean i'm I'm a newbie gamer but i i don't play like league of legends i, I play like board games online that's how old school i am <laughs> like um, yeah. like Catan. <laughs> oh hey i play Catan too <laughs> yeah yeah not online but yeah no i mean so i mean i've always been a gamer so like it's like until recently, it was always kind of my dream to work at Blizzard, mm, but yep. now that yeah. <laughs> so, probably not going that direction anymore. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, did you? So, I mean, basically, the lesson of that story is that as having a leadership position in the club allows you, gives you kind of this platform or excuse almost to reach out to people to to come and and build relationships. Yeah, definitely. And I, honestly, you don't even need to be the leader. Like, I mean, basically mm. anybody who's in it, like, doesn't can just reach out to people. Right. I was asking people in my marketing club the whole time, like, hey, can you guys, like, reach out to companies that you know and see if we can bring people in? Right. Like, it, we did get, like, some guy, uh, one of the guys from Calvin Klein came in. We got somebody from, like, Estee Lauder, I think. A couple big companies that we got to come in and give talks on marketing. And that was, they ended up being really helpful, too. Anything else during the MBA that can give international students a good chance to land, you know, a job they're happy with coming out of it in a foreign country? Hmm. Well, I mean, I just think you have to be outgoing. That's my biggest thing. <laughs> like, I mean, just like, don't sit in your room and study. That's not what you're there for. 
people always say the biggest value of an MBA is the network, right? Like you end up like meeting so many people that you probably never otherwise would have, right? Like I never would have met all half these like business executives and stuff that I met and I learned from and things like that, you know? So I think if I stayed in my room and just studied, yes, I would have still learned something, but I would not have anywhere near the connections or network I have now that could help me go higher in my career. I mean, can you give me a, like a concrete example of what that would mean, what that strategy would mean, you know, during business school, the trade-off? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, like, I don't know. So I was very involved with my group for everything. Like, I mean, pretty much any kind of event that was happening on school grounds, we would go to it. Um, any kind of speak, because I'm also CHK gives us tons of speakers that would come in for us and like tons of like networking and alumni events and stuff like that. So also another one, reach out to your alumni. That's a huge thing. Um, usually they're very helpful, like me doing this. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> like, right. Uh, yeah, no, we're willing to help. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm not going to guarantee I can get you a job, but like, I'm here. If you need help or advice or anything, reach out to me. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, like utilize your resources. That's the biggest thing. And MBA does give you a lot. Like, but it's not going to come slap you in the face. You got to reach for it. Like, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So basically attending a lot of events, that was the way you, yeah. Yeah. I would say like, I mean, that's how I met the guy who ended up giving me the internship that turned into my company. <laughs> I mean, what can you like dive into that a little bit? Like, do, oh, so you, so yeah. To, like, oh, is it embarrassing? Well, even better. <laughs> I'm just well, kidding. So he was actually looking for a sales guy at the time. And I was actually like, it was, like, I think the Christmas party. So we had free wine. So he so, was coming back to get free wine as an alumni. Yeah. And to meet, yeah. meet some more students. And I was just a dumb student, just drinking. Too much. And I just came up with this like ridiculous bravado. And I was just like, oh, I can sell anything. I heard you're <laughs> looking for a sales guy. I'm your guy. <laughs> like, just, and he gave me a shot. <laughs> like, I got lucky. You know, what are the important questions that international students should investigate, right, before they attend a top-ranked program in Asia? Because not many do still to this day. Yeah, I was the only American in mine, for example. Like, I mean, I mean, we had some Canadians, but <laughs> like, I was the only United States citizen there. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there are a lot of questions, right? Like, how comfortable are you outside of your comfort zone? I mean, can you survive outside your comfort zone? That's the biggest one, I think. Because in Asia, you are going to be uncomfortable a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, uh, there's times where, like, grandmas throw me out of the way on the sidewalk, and I just like, eh, okay, that's normal now to me. <laughs> like, but the first couple times, that really threw me for a loop. Like, you know, like, I mean, it's not like... It's not like you're going to like the jungle or anything. It's like a civilized, amazing place. But like, there's it's definitely cultural differences that you're gonna need to get used to, right? Like, I still hand people my business cards with two hands every time now. You know, like that's the Hong Kong way. Just you adapt. So I think you just have to question how adaptable you are and like how you can get out of your comfort zone. Hmm. Um, because if you sit in your comfort zone over here, you might as well just do it back in the U.S. Like, <laughs> hmm. yeah. And and would what advice would you have done anything differently if you had started a second time this year? Huh? What would I have done? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I think I got pretty lucky. I don't know if I'd want to risk it again. <laughs> Probably buy more crypto. That's it. There you go. Yeah, but that's not NBA related. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, hey, we were talking about fintech, and it was becoming a thing when I was in my MBA. <laughs> Oh, they changed the program the year after me. And I actually think they were pretty up to date on this. Like I was pretty impressed. And they actually created a separate career track. I mean, a, like a concentration track around FinTech. And I thought that was actually like, I kind of wished I was one year later just for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that really a huge, it sounds like it just from your anecdotes that um, that's kind of a big part of the economy now in Hong Kong, right? Or at least what, what people are interested yeah. in. Yeah, I would say just... I mean, Hong Kong has like FinTech week and like all these kind of crazy things about it. It's just, it's one of those booming industries that venture capitalists are loving right now and just throwing money at. Yeah. So like we have tons of like, uh, what are those called? Like uh, digital banks and stuff now yes. here. 
on this crypto OTC is opening like everywhere, re- like in retail spaces, like like where COVID kind of closed some stores and stuff. Now like crypto companies are sprouting up there, and it's like this is weird. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah. So I mean, that's one thing I kind of wish. I mean, I did get a lot of experience with it with my company because I did a little bit of a pivot into crypto for a bit. But um, I don't know. I do wish I kind of understood the f- fundamentals of it all, like regulations around it a little bit more. Yeah. I think I would have gotten that if I was one year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You. Who knows what you would have fallen into, right? Yeah. Who knows? There you go. Being there with a Lambo by now. <laughs> yeah. And and an apartment. Uh, filled with sharks swimming around right so uh you know i do want to bring up uh the protests the hong kong protests i mean hong kong is going through massive has gone through i should say and is going through massive change and those protests you know captured the world's attention in 2019 and you know really kind of challenged uh not just the people of course but hong kong's position and kind of branding right in the world, um, becoming more integrated with China. And I'm just wondering, you know, what was that like for you personally going through that, that experience and professionally? And do you feel like much has changed on the ground since? Uh, Okay. So, I mean, going through it myself, so I was here for the whole thing, right? I came here right after the umbrella protest, like the first ones, right? So like, what was that? 2015, right? Yeah. So it's 2014 was the protest. I came in 2015, right? So like already there was that kind of or uh, like kind of, you know, like about protests, you like knew about it, like, and generally there was a sense of kind of unhappiness with the government, I know that. Um, so I, mean, I, have, I have local friends and they are not happy with the current situation, yeah. Um, so I mean, I was never really like in the thick of it yet. I mean, I was, I did see CUHK, luckily I was before those big protests, right? Like, so. Which were held at a lot of the uh, universities, right? Yeah, yeah. And no, right? There's crazy pictures of huge protests yeah. right outside the building I was living in. Yeah. And you saw it on campus, too. Like, I mean, because the young people are the ones who are the most angry, right? So uh, you would see it in some of the, like, the like events and groups that they were going through and stuff like that. And there was a weird also mixture of like, because there's a lot of mainland students, too. So the Hong Kongers are like, Ooh, like, so you felt tension. That's the thing. You always felt a lot of tension. But I didn't think it was like a bad thing. Overall, like it didn't affect me that much until like when it actually started happening. And that was like what the first like probably the second year of running my business that actually was happening. And I was letting my employees work from home and stuff because the yep. MTRs were closed and stuff like that. Um, so it did affect business too. I mean, like people couldn't come into the office some days because trains were closed or like uh, I don't know. We're like we don't we might not be able to get home tonight if we go to the office because the trains might be shut down, right? And I mean, I remember walking like five MTR stations because they were like, they were closed. I had no other way to get where I was going. Right? Um, but I mean, recently, I mean, the latest developments. I mean, yeah, it is troubling. I would say to see Hong Kong kind of getting more integrated with China because um, Hong Kong does have a very unique identity. Like, and it's kind of sad to see that being like shut down a little bit and like kind of folded into the giant of mainland China. Because I mean. You know, there's all so much of mainland China. There's only one little Hong Kong, right? Like, I mean, it's very unique for how small of a city it is. Mm. Um, and like, I don't know. I, I mean, it's generally, I would say, on the ground. I mean, it's not like the world. The sky isn't falling, right? Like, I mean, we're okay. Like, business is fine. Like, yeah. and especially if you're doing business internationally, it's perfectly fine. Nothing's changed. Um, I do think maybe some of the luster has worn off um, because of that. Um, but I do think like, especially if you're going to be doing business with China, mm. it's still a great place to be, mm. right? Like, if you're in finance, it's still a fantastic place to be. Like consulting, I have tons of friends in consulting that are doing great here. Mm. Like there's downturn in any of those businesses that most MBAs are concerned about. Um, I do think as a business city, Hong Kong is still thriving. Politically, maybe people aren't very happy, but yeah. uh yeah, it's just there is a certain tension sometimes and you will feel it sometimes but it is still a city that's booming really. yeah. yeah yeah wow i mean has it affected sort of like you know the platforms you can use you know as a marketer or not really not yet um tiktok pulled out right so that was the only one that was the yeah yeah and that was surprising because that was a chinese company you were like <laughs> <laughs> right right 
So, I mean, that one was, I just think they didn't want to deal with the regulations for such a small city, like, um, and they had some specific regulation, I forget what it was, and um, they were just like, meh, not worth it, and just left. <laughs> like, yeah. On the other side, you see Amazon has come into Hong Kong now, and you're like, yes, finally! <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that, and, and so... You know, this has been you know, just a fun conversation for me to catch up on a city I love. And, you know, also just I hope this conversation sort of opens my listeners' eyes to the sort of reality they would face, you know, attending a top top program in Hong Kong. And even though, you know, Tony, you do come across as happy-go-lucky, happy happy-go-lucky, I would say. I do sense, you know, a real like ambition behind everything you're doing and and a sort of plan, you know. I know you're yeah. falling into things, but there's an undercurrent of, you know, putting in the work and getting out there and being outgoing and, you know, meeting people and I'm sure you've put in a lot of work. Um I just want to say, yeah, give you the floor. Any last thoughts? I mean, you've this has been a 5-year journey for you, you know, the MBA and to where you are now, right? Yeah. So yeah. Yes, just to people who are you know dipping their toes in the water here, um, any last sort of tips or advice to give? I mean, uh, it's kind of like what I said before. Just like I don't know, go out of your comfort zone, go somewhere random, like go somewhere you've never even thought about. Like I always thought I'd end up in Europe or like back in the U.S. somewhere with my career. I never thought I would be in Asia, and it's been so good for me. I would have never thought I'd be where I am today. Mm -hmm. Like just, I think just. Take the road less traveled. That's kind of my uh, like my whole philosophy, right? Like, I mean, just do things that you might not think you you might not even like it, but it's worth a try. Just try different things. Like, talk to people. Don't give up. Like, I mean, you can do it. Like, mm. I, if you find to it, you can do anything. It's cliche, but it's true, right? Like, I mean, that's really it. <laughs> how can I just ask? How has it been good for you specifically being in Asia? I don't know. I love it here. It's like food, culture. I can travel to so many different countries. Like I've been all across Southeast Asia. I've been to Vietnam where you are. Yep. Like I've been riding motorcycles over mountains. Like I've never would have imagined that in my life. Right? Like, I mean, I've been to Japan. It's amazing. Like, I have friends in Japan now I can visit. I have friends in Korea I can visit. I have friends in China I can visit. It's amazing. Like I, and even because the MBAs here tend to be more diverse, like you'll have like students that are in Europe too. So I have friends in Europe I can go visit. I can go like anywhere in the world that I have somewhere I can, someone I can call or a friend that I can just get put in touch with someone to show me around. Mm. And it's amazing. <laughs> like, I mean, there's no other way you can really get that network. I think that going out of your comfort zone and going to some foreign country and doing a diverse MBA program, right? Or some kind of school program. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Well, what an adventure, Tony. Thank you so much for, for joining us on the show. And Wishing you the best of luck at first page. And um, now, uh, you know, if I got questions on marketing, uh, I know who to go to. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, it was really fun doing this too. I mean, it's uh, always fun sharing my story. It's a pretty weird, random story. <laughs> but it's always kind of funny to talk about. Um, so thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully if you guys have any questions, you can always reach out to me about my experience or marketing if you're interested. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Anything else, you can find me. I'm pretty findable. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'll link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch 